What's up, people? Welcome back to the BCMA podcast. That's the Black Clover Martial Arts Podcast, and this is your boy Lucky from Lucky's Muay Thai, and there's not a lot going on. Everything's been kind of quiet since the election, which is kind of weird because it still seems strange because uh, he hasn't conceded and, you know, there's no transfer of power until January. So everything seems to be sort of just hovering right along. Anyway, that being said, nothing going much on in the combat sports front. I mean, they're talking to Gregor Poirier, that kind of thing. But Paul Felder stepping in on short notice versus RDA. But other than that, not too much. But before we get into me ranting about everything or nothing, uh, don't forget, if you like the show, keep the like, hit that subscribe button, share with your friends, uh, hit a comment below so I can know what you're thinking about and what's going on in your brain and um, how you're taking life right now. Um, so let's talk excuses. I've literally probably used every excuse in the book for everything in the book as have a lot of people. Um, you know, I mean, my dog ate it, the everything. I lost my keys. I mean, excuses are abundant just within life, right? You hear these things daily. And a lot of times it's just warranted. It is what it is. There was an accident. There is traffic. There is not always an accident. Sometimes you're just running late, right? You decide to get up five minutes later because you were just tired, whatever the situation may be. But when it comes to excuses, my man Deontay Wilder takes the cake. And I like this dude. I don't know. I don't know what to think about all of this. My brother came out and said uh, the uniform that he was wearing uh, to support Black Lives Matter, the big costume. Uh, was too heavy and it wore his legs out. And so then he didn't feel like itself. He was exhausted when he got in there. It weighed 40 pounds. Um, he said the ref was against him. His corner threw in the towel. His coach was against him. He hurt his bicep in training or before training. I, I don't know, man. I just feel like maybe he got outclassed. And it's just, it's a lot for him. I don't know what else to say. He just came back out now again. Now his coach is fired. It was his coach again. His water was spiked. Fury's gloves. Uh, he had an egg weight in them. Um, I, I don't know if it's him or I, I can't. I've just never heard of a champion of his stature, just the, the one punch knockout king act this way. It's not the way he's normally been uh, throughout his career. He's been really confident, you know, talking very, very confidently and then backing everything up. You know, listen, there's times that he's looked like he's been outclassed in boxing matches and a one punch um, KO is the thing that happens after that. Unfortunately for him in the last couple of fights with uh, Tyson Fury, it did not go that way. And, you know, you have to give some credit, obviously, to Tyson Fury being the same way, right, that Deontay Wilder was. Wilder was a very, you know, ferocious. He talked ferociously. He fought ferociously. And Tyson Fury basically, at least in the second fight, did the same thing. He said, look, I'm, I'm going to walk you down and I'm going to punch you in the face and I'm going to beat you up. And... Every interview, every time they spoke, he said the same thing. Every time anybody asked Tyson Fury what he was going to do, he said he was going to do that. And that's basically what he did. Now, was he in Deontay Wilder's head? I don't know. But he certainly looked like he was doing exactly what he said he was going to do. He kept Deontay Wilder on the back foot and basically beat him up to the point that the corner threw in the towel and it was probably about to be stopped anyway. He had already been hurt several times and dropped several times. The fight was about to be over. He for sure was outclassed. So why all the excuses now? I don't know. Why all the excuses then? I don't know. Why not just, you know, whatever. You already made excuses before. Yo, man, I'm back in the gym. I'm getting right. 
I'm trying to see Fury again for a third one. And I'm going to do what I didn't do in the first two fights. Something to that effect would have been way better than to come out and now say that your water was spiked. That there was an egg weight in the glove. That the commission obviously is pays very close attention to. I don't know. Has there been things, crazy things in boxing before? Absolutely. In every sport, there's been some kind of cheating, crazy thing. But yo, man, pick an excuse and stick to it. This is like eight or nine excuses over a period of time. At some point, people stop listening because they don't, it couldn't possibly be all of this. Is it all of this? Is that what you're saying? So it was everything. Literally everybody was against you, including your own body because you were injured. Your coaches. The costume, the water was spiked, Fury's gloves were tampered with, and there was a weight in the gloves. All right, man. I just want to see fight, man. Get out there and fight. And for anybody else, man, look, there, there are times where excuses are, listen, people, sometimes they get staph infection. They go and fight anyway. They lose. They're like, yo, I didn't tell anybody, but I got staff. I mean, look, they go in there trying to win. They're not trying to lose. They're not trying to lose their payday. They're not trying to lose their spot in the, in the, in the positioning and the ranking, so to speak. They're going in there to win. And unfortunately, they got staff. And then after it's over, they're like, man, you know, I lost, but you know, I had this happen. That's real. That could slow somebody down. There are other things, other injuries, you know, ACL tears and all kinds of things that can keep somebody hindered that they can't get surgery on or whatever the case may be until after they fight. And they don't tell anybody. Khabib just had a, a toe, broken toe, right? In training. He didn't tell anybody, right? They found out afterwards, even though he won the fight, but still. This happens. There are people that go through camp and no problems at all. But there there are legitimate, legitimate things that happen that sometimes people can say, man, this, this attributed, helped attribute to my loss. Of course, the other man was better that day. But this also attributed to my training or my loss in some form or fashion. Um, but I own up to my loss. But all this, man, I don't know. It's a lot. Anyway, let me know what you think. I'm tripping on it because, I don't know, there's not a lot going on. But don't make these kind of excuses. Jeez, bro. Anyway, I'll be right back. I got a question to answer. All right, people, if you want to stop by the gym, make sure you hit us up at www.luckysmt.com. You can fill out the form there and you get a free workout. You can message us there and we can book you a class so you can swing by and see if we're the right fit for you. We want to make sure that um, you like what we do. Uh, we're a small boutique, you know, family style gym. Uh, we keep the classes very small. You have to book classes so we make sure we don't overbook and fill out the space. Um, listen, if you're interested in learning some good Muay Thai, uh, getting in shape um, and some self-defense, uh, make sure you hit us up, www.luckysmt.com. Or you can drop me a line at Lucky's Muay Thai on Instagram just so you can uh, ask us some questions, things like that. All right, looking forward to seeing you there. Peace. All right, so I got asked a question by Philippe underscore 10 underscore. Uh, Philippe was actually a student of mine. You know, it's Tahiti Beach restaurant on uh, Miami Beach. You should check it out if you're ever in the area. Um, he asked, why are Muay Thai fighters so successful in MMA? That's sort of a strange question because it's, I don't know that they are so successful. They are, there are some that are very successful. But in order to be successful in MMA, you can probably neither be simply a striker, a wrestler, or a jiu-jitsu practitioner. You have got to have at least a, a more than a fair amount of something of the other things. The reason why high-level strikers sometimes do well, and they can be boxers as well, I mean... It's not as if Nick and Nate Diaz are huge Muay Thai fighters, right? They, they box. Um, and some, some people do well, some people don't. But the reality is, uh, the ones that do well, usually because they understand timing and distance pretty significantly over most, at least when it comes to striking and footwork at a high level like that, 
it's so, uh, and everything happens so fast and it is always such a matter of, of inches, right. Or less. Um, so when people are, unless people are really good at, at making great takedowns and the, God, this is really tough, man, because, you know, you can still be taken down. So that leads to the other part. Well, all right, let's stick with this. So the real, the real issue is, if I'm a really high level striker, do I have high level takedown defense? So how, how, at what level can I stop people from taking me down? So you look at a guy, you look at a guy like Connor and we fought Habib. He looked good for a moment and then it was what it was. But the reality is your takedown defense has to match the ability of wrestling of the other person or whatever they may, if they're a judo person or whatever the case may be, the takedowns of the other person. If it doesn't match it, then you have to have from your back an active guard. And obviously from top, you probably, you're probably going to do okay. You're probably going to know where and how to strike just based on the principle that you, that striking is what you do, right? If you know how to put your position, your body, in a way that keeps you in a, an advantageous position, then the striking part's going to come easy from, from those positions, mount and, you know, some kind of leg ride where you're controlling the wrist on the other side. Those things from the top are fine. But if you get taken down, do you have an active guard? Are you, are you, um, dang, I just lost his name. It's crazy. Um, can you elbow from the guard? Are you Tony Ferguson? There it is. Are you, can you elbow from the guard? Can you triangle? Can you work for arm bar? Can you, can you just do things to stop your opponent from working you to death on the ground and dropping hella ground and pound? So when it comes to high level Muay Thai fighters being really good, yeah, you have Brandon Vera. He was good. Anderson Silva obviously has fought some Muay Thai fights. Um, uh, Israel Adesanya's kickboxing, right? To me, you know, you go back to Mari Smith, who, was already good, but when he got into MMA, he had, he couldn't figure out. It took him going to, I think, Lions Den to figure out how to stop takedowns. And once he did that, I mean, he was able to do that to Mark Holman, right? He was able to stop him and then have an active guard on his back. He was like the, uh, the blueprint to what you need to be if you're a high level striker in MMA. You have to strike at a high level. You have to have takedown defense. And then if you do get taken down, you have to have the ability to be active on your back to at least negate the abilities of the person on top, if not try to submit them. And if you can't submit them and you can negate them, that's just as good. If you can get to somehow get back to your feet because there's nothing happening and you get to strike again where you have the huge, the, the biggest advantage. Yeah, man, that's, that's Maurice Smith. That's what he did. And everybody else sort of, I think, followed that suit. Um, he was one of the first ones to defeat, you know, a high level striker to defeat somebody that's, you know, known for slamming people on their heads and beating them up. So are they so, are, are Muay Thai fighters so good or so successful at MMA? I don't know. I think that still has yet to be seen. We've had some really good fighters. And now obviously with one championship, you're getting a lot more guys that were Muay Thai based and they look tight. They look really good. Now, I just need to see, like, I wish we could see more cross promotion so we could see the levels, right? And there's clearly levels to the striking. I mean, clearly levels to the striking. But can they match the levels of the, of the, the grappling and the wrestling? And I, that's what I want to see. That's why I think we need cross promotion. But what does that, what does that mean? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, some of these guys need to be fighting each other. From across, from around the world, we need to see something because, or they can stay separate, whatever. I mean, I just, I, I would love to see some of these guys from one fight, some of these guys from Bellator fight, some of these guys from, you know, whatever, from everywhere, from the UFC, from everywhere. Um, anyway, that was a good question because are they so successful? Not necessarily, but high level Muay Thai, kickboxing, boxing strikers could be, can be very, very successful if they can manage to stop the takedowns. And then be active in, in their guard if they are taken down. Like striking at a high level is super, super difficult. 
And that's why you don't see it very often. And that's when, that's why when you see it, you know, it's special, right? That's why when you see it, that's why when you know it's coming, you line up for it, you buy a ticket because you know that you're going to see something special. That's why you, those big, those big, big fights that everybody's buying for the pay-per-views, all that stuff, you know, you're going to see something special between hopefully both athletes, right? But yeah, I don't know about so successful, but successful. Yes, we've had a bunch more than a bunch. And I expect that we'll see more. I expect we'll see more. I mean, oh, did I leave somebody out? Joanna? Joanna and Jacek? Very successful. Very successful. High-level Muay Thai. Very successful in MMA. But she was more successful right at that part of the run where she started learning how to wrestle pretty good. And she was able to stop takedowns. That's when she became really a monster. Um, even though she was already pretty good at it, she got better at it. And then she was really a monster. And she had some brawls in there. Um, we had some tough, tough women. So, yeah, again, if they can keep to their feet, they're always going to be uh, pretty good. Doesn't mean you can't get knocked out in four-ounce gloves. People slinging overhands and punches come from weird positions. And people don't people aren't standing in traditional fashions. Um, so anything can happen. But... Yeah, man, that's my take on why Muay Thai is why Muay Thai fighters can are so successful. It is, are they so successful? And yes, they can be successful. All right, yo, that's my rant for this week. Um, I didn't really have much, but next week we're gonna get back into it. This is episode number twenty-four. If you like this show, make sure you hit that subscribe button, keep the like, elbow the elbow the subscribe button, uh, tell your friends about it. Uh, drop me a line at Lucky's Muay Thai on Instagram. If you want to stop by the gym, you know what to do. www.luckysnt.com. I said that mad fast because I'm a beast on this mic. Um, I love y'all. I am out. I hope y'all have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Peace.